Well, in the immortal words of Monty Python. And now for something completely different. <laughs> uh, Chris asked me to introduce myself, and I shall do so in a direct manner. I am not Tara. <laughs> like the other two papers, mine uh, paper in many ways can be viewed as an extended footnote, or like to think of it as a meditation on some of the points that Frank made in his uh, in Sutherland address yesterday. So I'm going to talk about emotions, choice, and harm. I'm sure in such a knowledgeable audience as this, I don't, go into, don't need to go into much detail on the rational choice perspective. As you all know, it's a perspective that assumes that uh, actors behave according to choices that they make on the basis of expected utilities. They, uh, weigh the costs and benefits of various things, and then they decide what to do. This perspective has a number of attractive features for both sociologists and criminologists. Uh, on one hand, it provides us with a motivated offender, or a motivated actor, I should say. A person who makes choices, who exercises agency, and uh, that gives us something that avoids problems that we used to call in sociology the over-socialized conception of human nature. That is, the idea that human beings are controlled by norms and neighborhoods, and so it avoids reifying macrosociological entities and gives us actors we can work with. Uh, it also avoids a certain uh, biological determinism. You know, we can think about genetic controls or things like that. For criminologists, the rational choice perspective also has a number of other attractive features. It seems to offer very concrete policy prescriptions. Choices, including criminal choices, really being are based on perspective utilities, then maybe there's something we can do to change decision making by altering expected utilities. This has had two sort of direct policy implications. On the one hand, it led to the uh, punitive movement, the deterrence movement, and the massive increase in mass incarceration. More recently, it has led to a less punitive approach, but it's nevertheless an approach based on the rational choice idea, situational crime prevention, which also assumes that we have an actor in a situation in terms of choices based on expected utilities, and if we can alter the configuration of various uh, uh, situations, we can get them to make a different choice. Okay. So, unfortunately, in addition to these attractive features, the rational choice perspective also has a bit of shortcomings. Uh, on the one hand, as many people have pointed out, pointed out, it really can't account for behavior that's based, not, doesn't seem to be based on cost benefit analysis. Altruistic behavior, for example, is a big problem for the rational choice perspective. I am not too concerned about that, because we're dealing with criminals and we're not worried about altruists too much, so <laughs> I figure we can ignore that, but that should be. But I am concerned about two other shortcomings, and one is that the rational choice perspective provides us with no metric for Comparing the costs and benefits. They tell us simply that people make these choices based on expected utilities, but they don't tell us, well, how do they balance them? How much vengeance is worth how much prison? How much sneaky thrill in the shoplift is worth how much chance of getting caught? They don't really tell us why people make the choices that they make. Okay. The third uh, shortcoming is that I'm sure you're all aware is that people are notoriously bad calculators. Although we all like to think calculate like this guy, very rational and everything. In reality, we're probably closer to this guy. At least I find myself close <coughs> to this guy. Human beings don't calculate very well. So there are shortcomings to the rational choice perspective that I think we need to Now, on the one hand, these sort of shortcomings might not be fatal if we can assume that behavior in general sort of follows average expected make choices and we make decisions then based on some simplifying assumptions. I'm going to argue, however, that we shouldn't make those simplifying assumptions. And that we that a better understanding of the relationship between emotions and rationality may help us overcome some of these shortcomings. Like the other presenters here, when Frank asked me to give this talk, I was sort of why, and I think I know why, it's Frank and I talk a lot, and, and for a long time I've been talking about emotions and saying, that, well, I think, you know, criminologists have 
ignored emotions. And from that, he mistakenly assumed that I actually knew something about emotions, which, which I don't really. But I, I was sort of, when I've been, I have been thinking about emotions for a long time. And what it really came out of was a period of my life when I really got into revenge movies. I was watching Chuck Norris and Charles Bronson and the glorious Clint Eastwood. And I, and, I, and I really liked those movies, even the bad ones. I really liked them. And I started thinking about them. What is it that I like so much? And, and I said, well, it's an emotional reaction. The revenge, when, you know, all revenge movies have the same structure. Bad guys do something bad at the start of the movie. A bunch of stuff happens. And then they get theirs at the end. And if they get theirs at the end, it's enormously satisfying. I just been thinking about emotions and, and why, how they affect the way that we respond to them. So anyways, I was always complaining to Frank that emotions, you know, criminologists have ignored emotions. And I got thinking about that so I said, like, well, that's not really true. You know, emotions play a role in a lot of different theories that criminologists have uh, prevented, most notably Jack Katz, where he's talking about sneaky drills and shoplifting. He talks about the seductions of crime from an emotional sense. Bob Agnew, if you read his work, he talks about negative affective states especially anger and fear as being important motivations to crime. Akers uses negative and positive emotions as potential reinforcers in his social learning theory. Obviously, Braithwaite and Sherman talk a lot about integrated shaming, guilt, shame, embarrassment, defiance. These are all emotional things. Uh, last year, I was here at a presentation that Peel Wickstrom did, and he talked about the moral emotions and everything. And Wilson and Hernstein talked about what they call low conditionability of psychopaths based on limited emotional arousal. So criminologists have talked about emotions, but I don't think they've done so in a very sophisticated way. And I think they've handicapped themselves by ignoring some of the things I'm going to be talking about later. When we get to emotions and rational choice, even the rational choice theorists kind of recognize they need to think about emotions. Rasmus and Bursic have talked about this. Ufer, excellent pattern Moster have talked about it in ways that I'm going to review in just a minute. And my colleague Sally Simpson, a great pattern master, he tried to <coughs> incorporate emotional ideas into their discussion of rational choice and corporate crime decision. The rational choice there is think about emotions this way. On the one hand, they view emotions as anticipated benefits, the sneaky thrills that the shoplifter anticipates before they take something. Uh, or they thought about them as anticipated costs, as the guilt